How do you read the Bible? What attitude of mind do you go into when you start to read the Bible? Are you willing to have one very important attitude, and that is to be taught, to be instructed, to be corrected? It always blows my mind when I think of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, we'll go back further than that. Go back to John Wycliffe, who believed that the average person in the country should have the scriptures in the language that they could read. So everybody could read the Bible in their language. And it amazes me how that when that all did eventually come about, that you would not have had a huge turning of theology by certain things that are written in the Bible. Now you did have some that caught these things and were willing to be corrected and taught, but by and large it was not that way. And many of the teachings and the beliefs that the Roman Catholic Church had taught for hundreds upon hundreds of years continued on. Acts chapter 2. We read here in verse 34, For David is not, now this is David, it doesn't say his body, it says David, the person, David, is not ascended into the heavens. Just a very simple and easy to understand verse. David is not in heaven. Now that should get you thinking. This is contrary to what most people grow up being taught in the society and in the churches that they're brought up in. They're being taught that if you're good and you're a Christian, you go to heaven immediately upon death. Well, you know, David, God the Father said, was a man after his own heart. And yet it says here, David, not his body, David is not ascended into the heavens. In past videos I've given you the very plain and easy to understand verse in the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 13 where Jesus said, No man has ascended to heaven except the Son of Man that came down from heaven. Very easy to understand. You know, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, was the God of the Old Testament. Now that is provable by many, many scriptures, and this video is not to prove that point, but he was. Jesus Christ, the one that became known as Jesus Christ, was the God of the Old Testament, and he did go up and down from heaven to earth. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses. He wrestled with Jacob. There are many verses in the Old Testament to tell you that God did come to earth at times and appeared unto man. So Jesus, the God of the Old Testament, did go up and down from heaven during the Old Testament period. And he said, nobody, no other person has ever done this except me, uh, th that I've come from heaven. I'm the only one. No other person has gone up and down from earth to heaven. Jesus should know he was there. We have in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John that no man has seen God, God the Father, at any time. I've given you those verses in the past, but I'm coming at it from a different angle today. Let's go over to Acts. You can pick it up. I want you to pick up the story flow here, Acts. You can pick it up with verse 6 down to somewhere verse 9. You can go over then to Acts chapter 24. The first verse, pick it up in verse 5, and then pick it up in verse 10, and you get the setting here, uh, and then you're coming to verse 20 and 21 in Acts chapter 24. Paul, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. 
Paul preached the resurrection of the dead. Now why? Why was it a very important doctrine to teach for the apostles the resurrection from the dead? Now Jesus healed people from death. We find a few incident in the Old Testament where a few were raised from death. So what's Paul getting at here? Well, again, you can pick up the story flow, chapter 25, 26, you can go on to, and then you're going to pick it up in chapter 26, verse 23, where Paul is saying that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should be raised from the dead. The first. Jesus Christ was the first to be ever raised from the dead. Now, what can this possibly mean? We'll use a little bit of logic in reading the New Testament. We know that Jesus raised certain people from death. We have it in the Old Testament. A few were raised from death. So what could it possibly mean here that Jesus would be the first that should be raised from the dead? Well, it should be logical to you by reading the whole New Testament and reading Corinthians 15 about the resurrection to immortality that Jesus was the first living human being to be raised to immortality, to be raised to glory, to be raised to eternal life. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus came back as a physical human being. Lazarus later died. Jesus is the first, Paul says, to be raised to immortality from death. That should be the logical plain answer. We go over to Colossians and we'll pick it up in Colossians here, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Paul says it again. He was the first born from the dead, the first to be, have and obtain immortality, glorification. He was the first from the dead to have that. It wasn't Enoch, it wasn't Elijah, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't David, it was Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to say here why. That in all things he might have the preeminence in all things, Jesus has the preeminence. And in being the first human being to be given immortality, to be raised from the death to eternal life, Jesus was the first. That he might have preeminence in that. All of the other people that have died from Adam have never obtained eternal life. They have never been glorified. They have never gained immortality. Jesus is the first one to ever gain immortality. A human being, the first one to be glorified. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and from Jesus Christ uh, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten, it says here, it should be born, because the Greek can either mean begotten or born, and as we've just read that Paul said, the first born from the dead, and the first begotten of the dead. Once again, Jesus is the very first human being that has ever obtained immortality, glorification, eternal life. I've shown you in past videos, Go to Hebrews chapter 11, and you'll read there, yes, about Enoch is part of that chapter. And then if you read on and keep your eyes open, willing to be taught and corrected, you will find that it says that these all died. And you'll go on and read further in Hebrews 11. They did not obtain what we are all wanting to obtain. And read the last verses of that chapter. They haven't obtained it. We yet haven't obtained it. We will all obtain it together at the resurrection, at the coming of Jesus Christ. 
when indeed all saints of all ages from the time of Adam will be brought back from the dead, but they will be brought back to glorification, to eternal life. That is what these verses are teaching here. It should hit you between the eyes. It can only mean when it says that Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, it can only mean that that was glorification. That was eternal life that he obtained. And he was the first human to do it. We read the 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. When you read Corinthians, the first 15th chapter, it is about the resurrection. It is often known as the resurrection chapter. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits, the firstborn of them that sleep. Death is asleep, my friends. Jesus made that clear in the Gospel of John. Death is asleep, and Jesus is the first fruits, the first one to be raised from sleep to immortality. Verse 24. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom, this is after the so-called thousand age or the age to come, the millennium so-called, he will deliver it finally to the Father. And that he put down all rule and all power and authority. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy shall be destroyed is death. Verse 28, and when he has put all of these things that subdued to him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God, God the Father, may be all in all. But verse 20, Jesus was risen from the dead to become the first fruits to immortality, the first to eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. But I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Those, come, those alive at the coming of Christ are going to be alive in the flesh and blood, but they will be changed to immortality. In a moment, he said, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and you can read about the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. The last trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, living, shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? No, because God has promised to his children that there will come a time when we will be raised from the dead or changed if we are still alive when Jesus returns, changed from mortal to immortal, from corruption to incorruption. We will then gain and have eternal life. But Jesus, as we have just seen, was the first to ever, the first human to ever receive immortality and glorification from flesh and blood into eternal life. These are the verses that are simple to read. A child can understand them, that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, the first one to ever attain eternal life. We need to be willing to let the Bible, as we read it, one of our attitudes should be that we are willing to be corrected and change whatever ideas we have been given by the way that we've grown up and the way that various churches have taught, you know, youngsters coming into their church when they're only two and three and four and you just grow up in this ready-made society with its churches, with its all its ideas, you know, we should be willing to let the Bible correct us. That is a very important point in really coming to understand 
the teachings of the Bible.